we are putting on a conference called Evolution Exposed. We pulled in experts on the subject of evolution for a total of 11 speakers and gave them just 15 minutes to give us their best. And on top of all that, a one hour Q&A panel session. You're going to love Evolution Exposed. Anyone can refute evolution. Due to the zoo, to me and you. Call that a fairy tale. Not allowed to ask questions. It made evolution look ridiculous. That was the foolishness of atheism. I yeah. knew I was going to get corrected. No, I wasn't even listening to your answer. <laughs> <laughs> this guy might be coming for you. Welcome to Apologia, and another installment of Evolution Exposed, Exposed. Our claim-by-claim -claim investigation of the Creation All-Star Mega Seminar. If you'd like to catch the series from the beginning, tap on the playlist above my head. For two episodes now, Brian Osborne of Answers in Genesis has been insisting that his company's interpretation of the Bible can be the only correct interpretation of the Bible. But finally, Brian ventures into the land of science to refute biological evolution using the checks notes non-biological field of radiometric dating. And someone say, well, okay, but then what about things like radiometric dating? Have it, has the science proved many years with things like radiometric dating? And the short answer is no. Please bear in mind, you cannot scientifically prove millions of years. Why? Because the Earth is billions of years old, not millions. 4.5 billion to be precise. Because we cannot observe or repeat millions of years in a laboratory. We certainly can't make a solar system and then wait four and a half billion years to see if it turned out the same. That seems like a terrible way to do science but we can measure the decay rate of uranium through its decay chain to lead in multiple different labs under a variety of conditions. Turns out, no matter how hard we try, we can't get uranium to decay any faster or slower. The half-life of uranium-238 to decay to lead-206 is always 4.5 billion years. This means that radioactive decay, and specifically uranium's decay, makes an amazingly precise clock for really old things. Here's a big key point you got to grab a hold of. Every scientist has all the same stuff in the present. Biblical scientists, secular scientists have all the same evidence in the present. The same rock layers, the same fossils, the same distant star, like the same radioisotopes, all in the present. But here's the key. They interpret those things differently in the present and make different assumptions about where those things came from, their history, their origin, and thus their age, based on their different starting assumptions about the unseen past from a human perspective based in their different worldviews. I hope he's specific about what assumptions he thinks geoscientists are making, because you don't have to assume anything about the age of the Earth or the solar system for uranium-lead dating to be accurate. And here's the key. If you start with the wrong assumptions, you'll most likely get the wrong conclusions. I don't disagree with that statement, but it does really matter what assumptions we're talking about here. Well, there are certain isotopes in our world that are unstable. They will change from one to the other, like certain types of uranium will change into lead. And we can measure in the present how fast that occurs, called the rates of decay. And then we can look inside of a rock sample, and we can measure the ratio of isotopes, uranium compared to lead. We can measure how much uranium has changed into lead, with some assumptions built into that as well, but we can measure the ratios of, of uranium changing into lead, how much has changed. So we take the rate of decay, multiply that by the amount of changed element observed in the present, extrapolate backwards into the past to make a guess about the age of the rock. I was pretty okay with his explanation right up until the point when he said guess. He skipped over a lot of details, but for a simplified explanation, I'm okay with the way he's presented uranium lead dating. But to say that the calculation results in a guess of the age of the Earth is, I think, misleading. What's happened is that if we do these measurements and the subsequent math, we've calculated the age of the Earth within some margin of error. Every measurement has a margin of error because no instrument is 100% accurate 100% of the time. Think about the speedometer on your car. If it says you're going 60 miles an hour, or whatever that is in Canadian, are you really going exactly 60? Could you really be going 60.2 or even 59.9 miles an hour? But it's accurate to say that you're going 65 miles an hour within an acceptable margin of error. While the margin of error on your speedometer doesn't really matter, in science it really does. When we present data or a measurement, we're always going to present our error bar. That's how it works from a big picture perspective. But friends, please notice. When do we measure the rate of decay, past or present? The answer is in the present. And if you, good sir, could demonstrate that the decay constant for any spontaneous nuclear reaction can change under any conditions, please contact Oslo and collect your Nobel Prize. 
because that would be the scientific discovery of the century and probably solve the global energy crisis. When do we measure the ratio of isotopes, past or present? present? I've been waiting for him to get to assumptions because that's actually super important here. You can't measure just any rock with uranium lead dating. It's usually used on a specific type of mineral called a zircon. Zircons are super special because they are incredibly resistant to weathering. So it's reasonable that they can stick around over 4 billion years. And when they form, they can incorporate uranium into their crystal structure, but very specifically not lead. So when you find lead in a zircon, the only place it could have possibly come from was the radioactive decay of uranium. When do we make our calculations, past or present? Present. I don't actually see his point with this bit. It's all done in the present with a set of assumptions about the unseen past. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. But which assumptions? What specific claim do you have a problem with and why? And hear me on this. The secular scientists, before they engage the evidence, they assume some foundational things. Before they even look at an isotope, they assume that the Bible's history is not true. I doubt they think about the Bible's history at all. What verse should I read to learn about the nuclear properties of uranium? That there was no global flood that rearranged this world roughly 4,400 years ago and affected rates to get. I've thought about this a lot. And even if there had been a global flood as described in the Bible, I can't think of a single mechanism by which a global flood would affect nuclear chemistry. I can't make it make sense. There was a supernatural creation roughly 6,000 years ago where God spoke the world into existence fully functioning and mature. They assume the Bible's wrong. <laughs> I promise there are not disclaimers in scientific journals that say, God is dead, abandon all hope, there is nothing but the void. Any scientist worth their salt tries to make as few assumptions as possible. And any assumptions they do make needs to be specified and justified. They assume you can and must explain all things with only natural processes. Because science only deals with natural processes. This is sort of like being surprised and incredulous that you can't drive a tuba. And thus they're not being neutral. No, not assuming the Bible and also not assuming any other religious text is the neutral position. Going in with the assumption that the Bible is literally true is the biased position. They're denying the Bible and they're actually embracing a secular religion in its place. So here's the thing, even if something like radiometric dating worked perfectly, it would not prove millions of years because of the faulty secular assumptions that drive their wrong interpretations. But which assumptions are you talking about? The only thing I've heard him say specifically is that scientists don't presuppose that the Bible is literally true. That isn't actually an assumption. If the account in the Bible were true, then the physical evidence we see, what scientists discover, should support that, whether they assumed it up front or not. Guys, it's anything. Perfect. Give you a few quick examples of the inconsistencies of radiometric dating as we begin to wrap up here. For example, with carbon-14 dating. Why does this first example have nothing to do with uranium lead dating, the only type of radiometric dating he's discussed so far? Part of a mammoth was dated to be 29,000 years old. Another part of the same mammoth was dated to be 44,000 years old. That would be a very slow birth. Poor mammoth mother, right? <sighs> Hold on. I have to go dig up a paper that's 15 years older than I am. Okay, the paper he's referencing here has dates for three, listen very closely here, three different mammoths. All three samples were found in the Gold Stream Formation, but at different locations within that rock formation that are specifically noted in the paper. Hair from one mammoth was dated to 32,700 years old, plus or minus 980 years and flesh from the lower leg of a different mammoth was dated to be 15,380 years old, plus or minus 30 years. They also had samples from a baby mammoth, but the sample had potentially been contaminated, so the dates were presented with a bit of a grain of salt. But those are also not the numbers presented in the video. I'm not sure where he got those numbers from, and I couldn't find any non-creationist sources for the Voslovich mammoth, and all the creationist sources that did mention it cite this same paper with different mammoths. So there's no smoking gun here. There's just two different mammoths who lived in the same region thousands of years apart. Please see my video, Hello, my name is Eric Hovind. 
to see my detailed investigation with a paper trail of how father and son, Kent and Eric Hovind, have both been pushing this same flawed mammoth claim for decades. Freshly killed seals are dated to be over 1,300 years of age with carbon-14 dating. That's often more than 1,000%. Seals don't live that long. I'm not even going to look at that paper he's citing. I'll just assume that the sentence there on screen is true. The issue there is that you can't use carbon dating to date something that just died. You have to wait around a bit until enough of the carbon-14 has decayed away to get an appreciable difference between the carbon-14 and carbon-12. The seal would need to have died at least 500 years ago in order for carbon dating to be accurate. Also, there's something called the marine reservoir effect. The ocean is very good at holding on to carbon for a long time. So the carbon that is incorporated into ocean plants and animals and is then eaten by other ocean life is older and has less carbon-14 than the carbon that plants and animals on land use. So scientists know that when you carbon date marine life, the date it gives you is too old. I found one paper where the date was off by 2,000 years. That was the biggest number that I found. So that's two reasons why we'd expect the carbon-14 age of a freshly killed seal to be off. This doesn't mean that carbon-14 dating is never accurate, it just means they use the wrong tool for the job, like trying to use a sledgehammer to fix a watch. A sledgehammer is the wrong tool for that job, but it's great at other jobs, like demoing your kitchen. Carbon-14 is a good tool when you're trying to date organic material on land that lived between 500 and about 60,000 years ago. Or we can test other methods like potassium argon dating. This one's often used to date in this rocks. That's lava flows that have cooled and turned into stone. And this one's a good one to test because we've seen this happen in history. We've seen lava flows occur, turn to stone. So we can date these rocks of known age with the methods if it's accurate. If you few examples, I can show you hundreds of time permitted. Rocks that formed in Sicily back in 1972 were dated between 200 and almost 500,000 years of age. Actual known age was 30 when they were dated. This is with potassium argon dating. Rocks that formed in New Zealand back in 1954 were dated over 3 million years of age with the potassium argon dating method. Actual known age was around 50 when they were dated. Rocks that formed in Hawaii back in 1959 were dated between 1 and 15 million years of age with potassium argon dating. Notice the huge margin of error and nothing close to the actual date of around 40. When they were dated. He doesn't even try to cite a proper paper here. But again, the issue is he's using the wrong tool for the job. The half life for potassium to decay into argon is one and a quarter billion years. If you try and date something that just formed, you're going to get a bonkers answer because effectively none of the potassium in that system has decayed yet. After 100,000 years, you barely have one ten thousandth of a percent. Think of that as a penny cut up into 10,000 pieces of potassium-40 decaying. No knowledgeable, honest expert would think that potassium-argon dating a rock less than 100,000 years old would yield valid results. Of course those dates are off, and someone wasted a bunch of time and money to have those samples dated when a simple Google search could have told them that was the wrong tool for the job. But these inconsistent results show the inconsistency of their foundational worldview about the past. You see, God's word is right about all things. If time permitted, we talk about how carbon-14 is a great confirmation of a young Earth. I have videos about that. Now, this is Starlight. is a powerful, actually, uh, argument for the biblical creation account. I also have videos about that. Check out more resources. Go to our website, answersandjustice.org. Tons of great resources, whether my book, Quick Answers, or the Answers Books. Fun fact, the Answers Books here were what convinced me that my acceptance of young earth creationism must be false. If you can pick them up used, they're an interesting opposite effect tool. But if instead you're looking for actual science, you should definitely head over to Science Side Up where Maddie teaches all kinds of fascinating science topics from climate change dynamics to chemtrails to detailed looks at young earth creation claims. She even uses eggs in her intro, like all good science shows should. Tap on the link in the description, subscribe for all her latest, and tell her apology I sent you. Next up on Evolution Exposed Exposed, we have Mark Spence. Senior Vice President of Living Waters Ministry, to give us his take on biology from the perspective of an assistant pastor.
if evolution is true, then black lives don't matter. Well, that's going to be our real treat, isn't it? See you over there. Later. <laughs>